The last thing anyone would want to hear is their doctor telling them they have cancer. And that's exactly what I heard from my doctor just a month and a half ago. She told me I had some form of lymphoma, which is a type of blood cancer. So I went back home stunned and at a loss for words and I just felt numb from the devastating news I just gotten and soon after my mind was racing all sorts of questions flooded me like why me what's going to happen to me are my wife and kids going to be okay above all I thought whose body am I in right now I was fine a week ago now I have lymphoma did someone swap bodies with me when I wasn't looking this news meant my life wasn't going to be the same and I was desperately trying to make sense of it all over the course of the next few weeks I learned a lot of things along the way, which helped me cope with the new reality I was living in. So today, I'm going to share with you five ways I cope with my lymphoma diagnosis. Before we get into that, please take a quick second to like this video and subscribe to my channel. And also, please hit that notification bell so you know right away when my latest video comes out. All right, so I just wanted to give you a little background about myself. This all started when I went to my GP or a doctor because I was having a lot of pain in my lower right backside that weekend. I thought it was appendicitis, but my GP ordered a CT scan because her hunch was that it was a kidney stone. And as it turned out, she told me that I had some form of non-Hodgkin lymphoma or NHL and she needed to refer me to a hematologist to find out which one I had exactly. So what is lymphoma? Like I said, it's a type of blood cancer and it happens when lymphocytes, a kind of white blood cell, mutate and spread faster or live longer than a regular lymphocyte. And mutated lymphocytes can spread as tumors to other parts of the body like the lymph nodes, bone marrow, and other areas. And this weakens the immune system over time. According to the Leukemia and Blood Cancer Organization in New Zealand, over 800 people are diagnosed with lymphoma every year, which makes it the sixth most common kind of cancer in the country. And the Lymphoma Research Foundation says that every five minutes, someone in the United States is diagnosed with lymphoma. Fast forward to a few weeks later, I went through a biopsy and a PET CT scan. And soon after, I was also hospitalized because of pancreatitis, which happened to be caused by the lymphoma as well. So at that point, my hematologist had formally diagnosed me with double hit lymphoma or DHL, which is a newer and more aggressive kind of B-cell non-Hodgkin lymphoma. How did I cope with the realization that I had this condition and needed to undergo chemotherapy for it? I'll start with number five, which is I didn't force myself to feel okay. I've come to realize that there is no right or wrong way to take a cancer diagnosis. You can take it with denial, grief, shock, and even anger. For instance, I was angry that this happened to me. My first thought was, why do other people get to be healthy and live their lives with no strings attached? And then there was the denial. I also thought my genetics should have made this impossible. No one else in my family had this sort of thing, but for some reason, I went through all of that. And in a lot of ways, I'm still going through that even now. And when this whole thing started, I honestly didn't have it in me to see the brighter side. At that moment, I was okay with not seeing the glass half full. In the back of my mind, I knew that would come later. But in the meantime, I gave myself permission not to be okay with it. And I chose to embrace the negative thoughts that were going through me instead of trying to fight them or fill my head with positive thoughts. And for me, the simple act of acceptance helped me cope with my diagnosis and everything that came with it. But what do I mean exactly? Well, it was around this time when I remembered a quote from Mark Manson, an American author who said, the desire for a more positive experience is itself a negative experience. And paradoxically, the acceptance of one's negative experience is itself a positive experience. So for me, trying to change an inherently negative experience like a cancer diagnosis would just backfire. And then there's another quote I remembered as well, which is from the poem, called The Guest House by Rumi. Now, Rumi was a Persian poet from the 13th century, but his work still holds up well today. And he basically says that being human is like having a guest house. All the emotions we feel, be it positive or negative, are like new guest arrivals. And the part that really struck with me 
was this. Welcome and entertain them all, even if they're a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house, empty of its furniture. Still, treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. I remember those timeless words and trained myself to accept whatever I was feeling. I accepted my experience for what it was. And eventually, that got me through the fear and anger I felt. By the way, you can read the full poem in the link I've added in the description below the video. And I won't lie, it was far from easy. It was a messy process and I'm still going through it on some level today. And currently, I'm working with a professional to help you deal with these thoughts and feelings as they come. It's super important to reach out to people like that, you know, aside from your family and friends. Okay, the next thing I did to cope with my diagnosis was... Number four, I found an outlet. There's another quote which I heard not too long ago, which was expression is the opposite of depression. And when I looked it up, it was from Edith Egger, a psychologist and Holocaust survivor. As it turns out, she's a New York Times bestselling author who's worked with the U.S. Army and Navy to help soldiers with things like PTSD. To her, forcing your truths and stories into hiding can be like a prison. So she recommends expressing yourself by writing down your painful thoughts and feelings. Even if you do this in complete privacy and keep it to yourself, it can heal and free you. And for me, aside from putting up this channel, I also found other ways to express myself. For example, I got into an intense creative burst during my first round of chemotherapy. I was taking a handful of medications to help me cope with it, and one of them was steroids. So I asked a nurse for a piece of paper and went on a steroid-fueled creative spree. I used to draw as a kid, and after many years, I picked up a pencil again and came up with ideas for a mascot of a coffee brand I'd been thinking about. And aside from the mascot, I drew a bunch of different logos and even a mock-up of a coffee van with my mascot wrapped on the side and the logo on the hood. I'm still working on the basic concept for the brand and looking at adding other stuff like a 3D printed keychain or a plush doll to promote it. And maybe I can either start a new coffee van business from the ground up or pitch it to someone who has a coffee van and partner with them somehow. But the point is, you can find your own way to express yourself, whether it's through art, music, journaling, or some healthy outlet you can direct your energy into. Okay, so the third thing that helped me cope with my diagnosis is number three, I leaned into the people in my life. So I realized that this thing was bigger than me and there were going to be a lot of aspects to having lymphoma that was beyond my control. And in my journey, I've learned to trust and lean on the people in my life, whether they were family and friends or complete strangers I've never met before. When my wife and I first got the news, she quickly stepped up and did everything she could to take care of me. And at first, it made me feel bad that there were going to be long stretches of time where I had to sit it out and let her take care of the everyday stuff. Stuff, like taking care of our kids and the house on top of her job. It took time for me to understand the bigger picture and my role in it. And right now, that means focusing on getting better so I can get back on my feet. So I had to lean on her and trust her during this whole process. I've also reached out to my family in the Philippines and the US, which means a lot of Viber and Zoom calls. We've been chatting a lot and I've been giving them updates on how I'm doing. And I'm getting a lot of support and love for them as well. The other big thing is trusting the professionals to do their job and letting go of my need to control things. One example I can think of was my biopsy. So this is the procedure where they take a sample of tissue from my body so they can analyze it in a lab. Mine in particular was called a percutaneous biopsy, which involved poking me in the back with a needle that would go through muscle and fat so they could get a sample of the tumor and figure out which type of lymphoma I had. And I was incredibly stressed and anxious leading up to the procedure, and not just because of the procedure itself. At this time, I was also flooded with those what if thoughts. Since I didn't know what I was dealing with yet, I was flying in the dark. And when I was lying face down on the CT scanner table, I felt really vulnerable and I could feel the tears building up. One of the staff asked me if I was okay and that's when I broke down and started crying. But they were really kind and patient with me and they didn't continue until I calmed down and they reassured me that everything was going to be okay. So that's when I learned to let go and trust them to do their job. And I've kept this in the back of my mind, whether it was the doctors, 
nurses, or anyone else involved in my health care. And aside from them, I've also been having regular calls with the people from the Leukemia and Blood Cancer Foundation and a psychologist from the District Health Board. So the point is, you can't really deal with this thing on your own, and you need to draw strength and hope from the people around you. Okay, we just have two left, and the next way I cope with my diagnosis is... Number two, I found small things to be grateful for. At some point during my first cycle of treatment, my sister reminded me that the little things are the big things. And it's really easy to lose sight of the small things to be grateful for when you're going through a weird and extremely challenging time in your life. And after I finished my first cycle, going back home was a heavy experience. On the ride home, I had thoughts like, the old me never came back from the hospital. I'm not the same person anymore. Things will never be the same and my life will never be normal again. I don't know how I can go through more cycles of this. Everything was changing so fast for me that my mind couldn't keep up and I couldn't process what was happening to me. And at that moment in time, I craved feeling normal again. I wanted back the old life I had before I got my diagnosis, but I knew there was no other direction I could go but forward. Then I realized all the little normal things I had were still there, even though things have changed now. And so I focused my mind on thoughts of gratitude. Whenever the dark what if thoughts took over, I made a conscious effort to be grateful for the fact that I could still enjoy the little things no matter what I was going through. It's as simple things like being able to eat with my family again, hanging out with them and watching movies at home, sleeping in a warm bed at the height of winter, waking up to a new day, and so on. For me, making a mental list of these things and cherishing them really made a difference. I remember reading a book called The Science of Happiness by Loretta Bruning, and she believes in the power of gratitude. In her experience and research, the simple habit of gratitude rewires your brain by creating neural pathways to be happier even during dark times in your life. To her, it's like building a highway in your mind for happiness to flow. That means you're less likely to go down the old road of negativity and hopelessness if you've created this new road for yourself. All right, let's go to the last one on the list, which is number one. I reconnected with my spiritual side. Before anything else, I just want to acknowledge and respect the fact everyone has different faiths and beliefs. But personally, I've used this time I've had to pray and connect with my Catholic faith. And honestly, it's given me a lot of comfort in a terrifying time in my life. More than that, the people from my church have rallied and offered a lot of spiritual and practical support. So aside from keeping me in their prayers, they've also offered a lot of rides going back and forth from the hospital and even picking up one of my sons from school and babysitting him when our hands were full. So I really leaned into my faith and the people in my community because I know I can't do this alone. And no matter what you believe in, try to lean into that and on the people in your community if you're going through something like this. Okay, that's all I have for now. And if you have any thoughts on what we have just talked about, please share them in the comments below. I'd love to hear from you and let me know what you've done to cope with something like this. And also, please like this video and subscribe if you haven't already. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.